join Forum IS Academy, trusted by hundreds of toppers, including IS Rank 1 Shruti Sharma. Hi, my name is Krishnan. Today I'll be doing the Hindu news analysis. These are the five topics for the discussion today. Let us go into the first topic. So the first topic is about Japanese Prime Minister's uh, visit to India. So what has been happening is every year since 2006, uh, either the Indian Prime Minister or the Japanese Prime Minister have been visiting each other. So this year, uh, uh, Japanese Prime Minister has uh, come to India. So why is this significant? Because uh, G20 president is India and G7 president for this year is going to be Japan. So they are going to discuss on a lot of areas. So uh, why is this visit significant? Because uh, uh, G7 and G20, they have a lot of uh, common agendas, right? So they are going to talk about these agendas. What are the main agendas? Food issues, energy security issues, those areas are there. Ukrainian conflict is there because uh, the West has taken one stand with regard to Ukraine and India has taken another stand. So need to discuss on those issues because in G7 and G20 there are a lot of uh, conflict with, res with uh, respect to how these countries are going to take a stand. And next is what uh, Japan is going to unveil a $75 billion plan. What is this plan called? Free and open Indo-Pacific. So this plan is uh, mainly it is against uh, China's Belt and uh, Road Initiative. So what they'll do here is they'll give uh, uh, in uh, for low uh, interest, uh, you'll be getting infrastructure projects, uh, maritime security, air security, all these things you'll be getting through this free and open Indo-Pacific plan. So who's going to do this? Japan is going to do this. So this plan was unveiled uh, here in India. And uh, and Japanese uh, uh, Prime Minister, see, he's very straightforward about one thing. So what is telling? We need global consensus on issues in involving Russia and China. So what is telling? India is being too soft on Russia. So he's telling India should call out Russian aggression in Ukraine. Like that he's telling. So here what you should know, you should know free and open Indo-Pacific. And uh, what is the <coughs> main thing that Japanese PM wants? He wants to call out Russian ag aggression in Ukraine. So these two things he wants. So uh, we should know this about uh, India. India and uh, Japan, they have very close bilateral and multilateral ties. Multilateral ties as in they are part of Quad also. Uh, so And there are a lot of collaborations where bullet train, uh, Japan is only doing the bullet train project in India. Infrastructure projects to link Bangladesh and India's northeast. So in India's northeast is a very uh, sensitive area, right? No other country is allowed, only Japan is allowed. So that shows how strong the friendship is between India and Japan. And uh, why this year meet is significant? Because India president of G20 and Japan president of G7, which will be held in Hiroshima. So we need to synchronize priorities. So what India should do? India should make sure that the global south gets maximum out of the summit. Because generally, developed countries have their way, right? Uh, so here, India is the president. So other global south developing countries are dependent on India to voice their opinion. So India should make sure that the entire global south uh, gets something out of this summit. But what India is telling is push back against Chinese aggression and ending Ukrainian war, common goals. So we also want all these things. But uh, how we take our position with regard to these issues is different. So, uh, so that is what uh, the editor is telling. However, it is wrong to assume that both are similar. Yes, we want all these things to stop. stop. But our position and your position is not the same. Because, uh, see, uh, Japan will easily condemn Russia because uh, Japan is part of US alliance. But India is not part of US alliance, right? So, and what has happened? Uh, Japan has joined Russian sanctions. India has not joined these sanctions. Uh, India is not part of these sanctions. And see, uh, when it comes to LAC, India has been very vocal. But uh, there are Chinese aggressions in South China Sea, Taiwan Strait and all. But uh, India has not voiced its opinion, right? So, uh, India has taken a very careful stand. So, whenever it, uh, it is uh, coming to aggression with respect to uh, Chinese aggression in India, India is voicing its opinion. But in other areas, India is not uh, stretching the rope. Because uh, uh, India is feeling if it uh, stretches too much, then it will go against Indian interests. So, 
again uh, uh, why india needs to walk in the middle is because india is a special invitee at g7 so g7 india is not a part of g7 but still uh, modi has been invited and what will happen uh, uh, seo summit is going also going to happen for that z and z jinping and putin both are going to come so what uh, the edit- editorial is arguing is india should not give into the pressure even from a dear friend like japan so what they are telling japan is uh, wanting india to act in a particular way but the editor is telling no 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 don't act in it whatever you are doing right now is the right stand because you cannot stretch the rope too far then it will be- become a uh, detrimental to your own interest see in geopolitical issue this is, this is how the stand you should take so like that uh, the editorial is arguing in favor of india's position now let us move on to the next topic this topic is about uh, china coming up with a new framework for its uh, geopolitical view so let us go into the topic so why is this in news because china is uh, foreign affairs uh, minister recently he unveiled something called as global security initiative concept paper so global security initiative so this is what uh, the chinese minister of foreign affairs has uh, unveiled recently so what is the global security initiative talk about mutual respect openness and inclusion multilateralism mutual benefit and a holistic approach so these are the five things so this is like a doctrine so their uh, foreign uh, diplomacy will be revolving around these five areas so this is what the chinese uh, minister of foreign affairs is telling so but what experts feel is uh, this gsa is nothing but an empty narrative so generally usa will come up with things like this right so to counter the us uh, china has come up with something like this but uh, all these five things china has never followed so the author is telling this is just an empty narrative so this is what is telling so there is divergence among us and other developing nations so there are uh, with respect to ukrainian issues and other uh, uh, with rise of multilateralism there is no longer bi- bipolarism right there is multipolarism so because of uh, those issues a lot of countries uh, there is divergence between us and other countries so china is uh, trying to fill the gap and become an alternative leader so uh, so this is what they are trying to do with these five things but they are not following these five things but they are telling we are following these five uh, things so this is what the other is telling Uh, let us look at china's engagement uh, objectively and we come to a different conclusion so this is a different picture completely because they are talking about these five things but they have never followed it so what is uh, firstly they are talking about uh, mutual respect and trust but see china has never demonstrated trust or respect for its neighbors so already we are seeing right uh, uh, with india uh, there is a problem along the lac and uh, Uh, with other southeast asian countries also there are problems with respect to south china sea and east china sea so uh, here they are talking about mutual respect but uh, they are not uh, showing that to their neighbors uh, india and other uh, southeast asian countries and uh, see they are not uh, obeying uh, convention of law of the seas whatever orders they give they are not obeying it and uh, in the ec- exclusive economic zone also even in other countries exclusive economic zone they are not giving them their rights for example you know right in the south china sea uh, this uh, exclusive economic uh, zone overlaps but other countries are not being allowed to use their own uh, uh, sea so china is doing all these things secondly second what they are talking about openness and inclusion but uh, china follows exclusionary policies in east and south china sea so what is this exclusionary policy outrightly they have rejected the freedom of uh, navigation incident in the international law so they are not allowing others to come and use uh, south china sea or east china sea so this is, they are doing all this and they are talking about openness and inclusion next is uh, they are trying to secure their sphere of influence in this region they are not being open they are not being inclusive they are trying to secure their power only next next what they are talking next they are talking about uh, multilateralism but see they are trying to Uh, undermine and dominate uh, asian members and next uh, what is it they, they are uh, not uh, establishing the code of conduct for south china sea so these things are not doing and they are talking about multilateralism next what they are doing they are even showing their military power in these areas next uh, uh, china talks about positive uh, some cooperation but uh, what they are doing they are they are giving uh, uh, credit for unsustainable infrastructure uh, project and uh, because of this there is mounting uh, debt on developing nations and these uh, developing nations come and surrender themselves to uh, 
uh, China. This is what we saw in Ch- Sri Lanka, right? This is what happened with respect to Hamman Tota. This is what is happening in Africa. So they are talking about positive some cooperation, but what they are doing, they are making other uh, countries uh, submissive to them. And next, see, they did a joint exploration in South China Sea. What happened? Philippines and China. But what uh, China did is they said we'll do the exploration together, but you should give us more share. So this is a very silly thing, right? But China is doing all those things. So so finally, in a multipolar world, uh, so why all these uh, views are uh, clashing? Because US, Japan, India, we want to uh, maintain status quo. We want to safeguard the established order. But China wants to uh, change this, and China wants to secure its power. So this is why uh, whatever uh, it is talking is uh, against its own interest. They are talking about these five things, but they are not following it because they want to change the world order. So again, what it is doing, it has been seeding insecurity among world countries. How they are doing it? See, no accountability with respect to COVID-19. Nobody knows where it started, how it started in China. Uh, researchers are not able to do any research. Next, what is happening? Insurgent groups are armed in Myanmar. So there are a lot of insurgent groups in Myanmar. China is giving safe havens for them. So, what the author is telling is, this GSA is not sustainable, equitable and transparent, it's just hogwash. So, what is telling is telling, this is nothing but an attempt to counter US through empty narratives. Because you are talking about these five things, you are not, not following even one of those things. But why are you coming up with all these things? Because you just want to uh, counter uh, US through all these empty narratives. That's why you are doing all these things like that the author is arguing. So let us move on to the next topic. This topic is about how infrastructural projects in the Great Nicobar Islands uh, will be detrimental to the islands in the long run. So let us uh, have a look. So why is this in news? Because the Ministry of uh, Environment and Forest, they have uh, cleared projects worth uh, 70,000 crore rupees in Andamar and Nicobar Islands. So what is this plan called? The plan is called the Holistic Development of Great Nicobar Island. So what and all they are going to have? They are going to have a trans- transshipment port at Galatia Bay and gas and they are going to develop gas and solar plants, residential townships uh, to support uh, ecotourism and they are going to establish offices of uh, MNCs, multinational corporations. So this is, the, this is part of the plan called the Holistic Development of Great Nicobar Island. So but the, what, what is the first thing that is going to happen? First thing is this is going to lead to cutting down of a million trees so that is the first thing and they are going they are going to lead to destruction of coral reefs so uh, this is the main thing so just have a look at the map so you should know what this duncan pass is uh, what it is separating it is separating little andaman and south andaman and then have a look at 10 degree channel it is supporting little andaman and karnicobar and this is uh, indra point and uh, saddle peak so have a look at all this uh, places they might ask in prelims so so what are the issues with the project uh, see the island population itself is 8000 only but uh, once the project is completed 3 lakh people will enter uh, nicobar island so they are telling nicobar islands cannot uh, the carrying capacity of uh, nicobar island is not that much 3 lakh people cannot be uh, sustained there that this is what the author is uh, uh, trying to tell so they are telling uh, see don't try to urbanize this area because uh, the ecological and environmental cost will be too huge to bear because see Nicobar Islands is not like just another place this is this has high marine and terrestrial biodiversity and it is ecologically fragile so that is very important right so they are telling uh, don't try to urbanize uh, these areas because it is ecologically fragile so see uh, how do we know this place is ecologically fragile is because this island is spread over 900 square kilometers uh, and it is a biosphere reserve and it is a part of man and biosphere program of unesco and three-fourth of this uh, nicobar island this andaman and nicobar island is under the protection of aboriginal tribes regulation so there are a lot of tribes there so so the author is telling why are you why do you want to develop a place like this why do you want to compete with singapore singapore is a urban conglomerate it is a city state uh, but uh, Andaman Nicobar has a lot of uh, uh, terrestrial and marine, marine diversity, a lot of uh, vulnerable tribes live there. Why do you want to uh, make that a Singapore? That is so stupid. Like that is telling, is telling this is ecocide. So uh, you can use this term ecocide means ec- ecological suicide. 
so is telling this is eco side don't do this so but who is spearheading this plan niti ayog only spearheading this plan niti ayog only came up with the idea to urbanize uh, andaman and nicobar islands so these are the uh, the this are the shompen tribes so in nicobar shompens live so keep that in mind the shop the shompens live in nicobar so <clears throat> so next thing obviously if you go into this ecologically fragile areas will infringe on the rights of vulnerable tribal communities like shompen so they'll also face lot of problems because of us going and venturing into nicobar islands and uh, uh, because of this we are going to uh, fell a lot lot of uh, trees and we are going to destruct the forest so what the plan says is where will the forestation happen a forestation will happen in haryana and madhya pradesh so the author is laughing at it this is called far field of forestation and this does not work at all you are, you are destructing forest in andaman and nicobar islands and you are uh, uh, planting trees in haryana and madhya pradesh how does that work like that is uh, asking so is telling this is nothing but farcical and this project will destroy coral reefs but what the plan says the project uh, recommends translocation that is they'll take the coral reefs and they'll keep it somewhere else and they'll uh, they'll uh, make it grow so what the author is telling no 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 the because if you translocate and all corals will have very low survival rate and and they will be susceptible to bleaching so coral bleaching will happen and their uh, uh, survival rate will go down so i telling don't do this and next what is telling see why do you want to develop great nicobar island see it is close to the ring of fire so you had 2004 tsunami right only because it is close to ring of fire all these things are happening uh, it is vulnerable to disaster so why do you want to develop this place as a uh, why do you want to develop this place as a like singapore like that uh, he is asking so so he is telling see uh, the coast the coastline height reduced to post tsunami but now satellite images show the height has been regained so what he is telling is see uh, there is increase in reduction of island so this this shows uh tectonically this place is very vulnerable so there is a high plate movements after tsunami the height went down now the height has increased this shows it tectonically it is very uh, weak so which means it is uh, prone to earthquakes and other disasters so the author is concluding uh, telling uh, see this is an unsustainable development project already you are dilating a lot of environmental laws to come up with this project so please don't do this stop this is telling gdp growth make makes no sense if you are dis- if you are dis- uh, destroying nature and natural capital so don't do it what, what what are you going to get by having increasing your gdp but then all your forests are gone it, it doesn't make sense at all right so he's telling follow the green development model so this is what the prime minister has been talking about right he's talking about green developmental model so he's telling only green development model should be your guiding principle uh, don't follow all this unsustainable methods this will not work well for the future this is what the author is trying to tell let us move on to the next topic this topic is about waste to energy plants that is uh, creating uh, biomass plants that will uh, convert bio waste into electricity so in this we'll see what are the problems with respect to all these plants and how to overcome them so why is this in news because uh, the kerala government uh, recently announced the state's first waste to energy project in kolikod so this is the first waste to energy project in kerala where it is there it is in kolikod so they will generate about 6 megawatt of power so uh, so uh, why do we come up with all this waste to energy projects because uh, first what it will do it do is it will use non recyclable dry waste so it uses non recyclable dry waste what are non recyclable dry waste like e waste uh uh you know uh, plastics all these are uh, non recyclable dry waste so what it will do using these things it will generate electricity so because of that what will happen it will increase the state's uh, power generation capacity and solid waste management burden also it becomes easy because you don't have to dump them in landfills you can just uh, uh you know compost them so these are the uses of waste to energy projects that's why uh, states come up with these projects so uh, here we see a, a little data so here we say solid waste in india is 55 to 60% biodegradable organic waste 
ட்வெண்ட்டி ஃபைவ் டு தேர்ட்டி பர்சன்ட் நான் டிக்ரேடபிள் பயோடிக் பயோடிக்ரேடபிள் ட்ரை வேஸ்ட் ஆஃப் திஸ் நான் டிக்ரேட் நான் பயோடிக்ரேபிள் ட்ரை வேஸ்ட் ஒன்லி டூ டு த்ரீ பர்சன்ட் இன்க்ளூடிங் ஹார்ட் பிளாஸ்டிக்ஸ் மெட்டல்ஸ் அண்ட் இ வேஸ்ட் இஸ் ரீசைக்கிளபிள் ஸோ திஸ் இஸ் வாட் இஸ் இம்பார்ட்டன் ஸோ நான் பயோடிக்ரேடபிள் ட்ரை வேஸ்ட் ஸோ பிளாஸ்டிக்ஸ் மெட்டல்ஸ் அண்ட் இ வேஸ்ட் ஓன்லி வித் தீஸ் திங்ஸ் யூ கேன் திஸ் ஆர் ரீசைக்கிளபிள் அண்ட் ஓன்லி வித் தீஸ் திங்ஸ் யூ கேன் ஜென்ரேட் எலக்ட்ரிசிட்டி so so what is the process that is followed here uh, combusted to generate heat and this heat is later converted to electricity so this is how waste to energy projects work but very often we see all these plants fail right so uh, they seem like simple solutions but uh, they have many solutions and that's why they have many challenges and that's why uh, they fail uh, many times because uh, why they fail is because low caloric like calorifical low calorific value due to improper segregation what is calorific value uh, how good it can burn that is called calorific calorific value right uh, but due to improper uh, segregation what happens is we put all the waste together and because of that the calor- calorific value becomes close to 1500 kilo calories per kilogram which is not suitable for uh, power generation why because so we, we saw earlier right we should have non biodegradable dry waste so biodegradable biodegradable waste has high uh, moisture content this moisture content is not good for heat generation and because of that heat electricity cannot be uh, uh, generated so uh, those things you should compost you should not bring it to the uh, solid to i mean uh, en- waste to energy projects so but see here the calorific value of segregated and dried non recyclable dry waste is 2800 to 3000 kcal kilo per kilogram so this is the difference biodegradable waste you do not bring them here because their calorific value is very low but you see this non recyclable dry waste their calorific value is twice that amount so it is 2800 to 3000 kcal kilo per kilogram so this is ideal for uh, power generation so so what you should do if you want this uh, dried non recyclable dry waste what sh- what you should do segregation should be streamlined so and why do they fail uh, first thing we saw second is high cost to run this project so uh, if you want to develop uh, energy from electricity from these projects for one unit it will cost 7 or 8 rupees but you see if you buy uh, electricity from coal hydroelectric and solar power plants then it is just 3 to 4 rupees per unit so this is why all this uh, solid waste uh, energy projects are failing next what why they are failing improper assessment high expectations from these plants improper characterization study and on ground condition all these things you are not taking into account and uh, you are coming up with this project so that is why it is failing like that the author is telling so and see in a tropical country like india in a very short span you have a lot of rainfall right so quantity of wastage is also high because of rainfall so because of that also a lot of things go waste so what is the main thing that you should know is they can generate uh, uh, electricity only with non recyclable dry waste but but what is happening uh, they are expected to use all types of waste with that they cannot uh, produce electricity so how to overcome this challenge because uh, what you should do people itself should segregate at the home itself there should be strict segregation segregation practices and uh, don't bring biodegradable waste here you process it separately next what they are telling you focus on municipal collection efficiency so collection people when they are coming there you in- increase their efficiency like that they are telling and focus on moisture content if there is moisture content calorific value will go down right because of that you cannot uh, generate electricity so focus on moisture content and you focus on operational efficiency because uh, low operational efficiency will lead to high moisture content so he is telling focus on uh, these areas so uh, so he is telling if you focus on these areas uh, efficiency will go up and if efficiency goes up electricity generated also will increase so this is what the author is trying to tell so while concluding he says what, to overcome challenge first thing what you should do you ensure that only non biodegradable dry waste is sent to the plant so that is the main thing only that will lead to high calorific value next is telling there should be tripartite agreement between municipality the plant operator and the power distribution agency so municipalities will bring the waste to the plant operators 
and uh, if the plant operators want to sell the power they can sell it to power distribution agency so there should be tripartite agreement so next what you do you conduct field studies and learn from experience of other projects so that your current project will not fail so this is what the author is trying to tell in this article let us move on to the next topic this topic is about uh, supreme court asking the government of india to find out if there is a more humane and a dignified uh, way of executing prisoners so right now uh, you know right uh, uh, if you are given uh, if someone is given death penalty uh, they will be uh, executed by hanging but now supreme court is asking the government of india to find if there is any other method that is more humane and re- reliable so what has happened chief justice of india chandrachur he has uh, mooted setting up an expert committee committee com- consisting of uh, academicians law experts doctors to see if there is any other method that is available so what the court is saying the court is telling it needs better data on various other methods what are the various various other methods that are available one is you have hanging that you have already other is in us they have something called as uh, lethal injection and there is something called as firing squads also so the so the court is saying it needs data on all these issues uh, to come to a conclusion so and what is the bench saying it wants to know what science is telling with uh, respect to giving a humane execution is is there a is there a better way is there a dignified way so what science has to offer in these areas the bench wants to know so what has happened is a petitioner has challenged the constitutionality of death by hanging so a uh, petitioner is telling hanging is not uh, constitutional it is unconstitutional but what the supreme court has accepted is no no this is a uh, area of uh, this is legislative area we don't have anything to do with it see already how do we uh, give uh, death by hanging it, it comes from the criminal procedure code crpc section 354 subsection 5 that only says death by hanging uh, so the judge is telling no 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 we are not going into the legislative uh, competency uh, we just want to know if there are other uh, humane and dignified ways so uh, what was the pe- petition about what did the petitioner ask for uh, he asked for a quick dignified and more humane method so he is telling uh, a death by hanging is not a humane method so he is telling hanging is as cruel as lethal injection followed in the us so what they do in the us is uh, they just uh, give injection so with syringe uh, if you are a death convict uh, with a syringe they inject you and you are dead so he is telling this is also lethal that is also lethal but what justice narasimha is telling is hanging is closest to painless he's telling hanging only is the right method that is the most painless method others are very painful uh, so he's telling uh, see lethal injections they might look very simple but heavy patients what happens is after giving that injection they struggle a lot so and uh, he's telling this lethal injections at the outset they may seem very calm patient and serene but there are a lot of botched up uh, injection lethal injection executions that have gone in the us so a lot of people have messed up this uh, injection giving method for execution but what central government is telling central government is telling no no this is not barbaric this is not inhuman this is not cruel this is the most uh, uh, painless and the most dignified way of dying so we don't want to change this and what they are telling firing by death squads and lethal injections are more cruel so this only is the right method like that they are telling so is telling hanging safer than other uh, other methods so is telling and what the government is telling see don't focus too, too much on all these things because death penalty rarest of rare in india see from 2012 to 2015 only three people we executed by hanging so don't focus on all these areas like that uh, they are telling so constitution of death penalty is well settled uh, no one can say it is unconstitutional because in dina versus union of india and bachan singh case in both it is well esta- established that hanging is hanging is constitutionally valid so, uh, so since prelims is around the corner uh, we'll de- we'll discuss the previous year questions so in the federation established by the government of india act 1935 residuary powers were given to governor general and the well known painting of banidani belongs to so all these are facts you should know because uh, questions on paintings architecture sculptures uh, have been asked very frequently uh, recently so you should know so the banitani painting belongs to the kishangarh school so 
so with reference to cultural history of india consider the following statements most of the tyagaraja krithis are devotional songs in praise of lord krishna so if you had uh, heard tyagaraja's uh, krithis you know he sang praising only rama not krishna so option 1 is 1 is wrong so if you eliminate one a is gone c is gone now we are left with b and d next is tyagaraja created several new ragas yes anamacharya and tyagaraja are contemporaries no anamacharya kirtanas are devotional songs in praise of lord venkateshwara yes uh, even now anamacharya is a descendants only sing all those devotional songs for uh, lord venkateshwara while they put him to sleep so the answer is 2 and 4 only so this is this was a this is a bit uh, difficult question but uh, you know when you are uh, preparing for prelims prepare on these lines also so despite being a high saving economy capital formation may not result in significant increase in output due to so this is a basic question from the uh, economics uh, book itself it is there in uh, uh, economics book ncert book so high saving economy but formation is not uh, significant so there is no increase in output this is be- because of high capital this is because of high high capital output ratio so option d is the right answer what is high capital to output ratio because even if you have uh, enough savings because to develop uh, uh, enough output you need high capital so even if you have high savings to to create a very small output you will use all the high capital so because of that the output will be very low so this is called this is because of high capital to output ratio so uh, so this is what uh, it is about so i hope you uh, understood all these things uh, you can like share and subscribe you can follow us on youtube instagram telegram and facebook thanks for tuning in i'll meet you again thank you